Okay, we're gonna start. People will be late, they'll come. If they don't, <laughs> watch the recording later. Um, that's the beauty of technology and COVID time. So <laughs> right. uh, thank you so much, Mike, for being here. So excited. Uh, My pleasure. I want to first acknowledge that I am on the unceded and stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil to people on what is called Turtle Island, on so what we call Vancouver, BC, Canada. Um, uh, for me, land acknowledgments are a really important part of my how I operate with Van Vogjam and also my own practice as we continue this dialogue with the reconciliation and uh, the rights to Indigenous people who are the first and original keepers of the land and water uh, here on Turtle Island. Um, I am really excited to have Mike Q here. Um, this is like this, like everyone knows Mike Q. If you're in Balm, if you don't know Mike Q, you're under a rock. I do not know how you not how do you do, how you do not know. So um, I actually, I think our first real like thing we did was last year with Lou Lemon. I was approached yes. by them to do a, a, like a little campaign. Uh, and I was like, we have to, we have to bring it in a way where I feel like it it makes sense. So I was like, why can we get my Q in into the mix? And they're like, yeah, we got a budget for that. I was like, oh my gosh, you guys got a you have budget. <laughs> First of all, period. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Mer uh, Renata, I'm just gonna take your video off for now until we do questions later. Is that cool? You're beautiful, but we just gotta keep it consolidated. Um, and then it just worked out, and my Q was so down, and like, I mean. It's a it's such a it's such a random thing for Lula to want to include ballroom or Vogue in general. So I thought it was a really cool opportunity to like do it right. I feel, uh, but yeah. And so we have Mike here today. I've tried multiple times to want to bring him since then, but of course because of COVID, it's been really hard. So hopefully in the future we'll bring him in real life here uh, in Vancouver. Um, and then I'm gonna give it off to Mike Q to have a very humble brag about let him come out. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello everyone. Of course, I'm Mike Q. I am a 17, almost 18 year veteran DJ of ballroom culture. Uh, I started here in New Jersey and over all of these years have taken it to being worldwide and DJing in different countries and cities and balls all over and here with you today. We love it. Oh, see all the people are coming in now. <laughs> See, we're just, we're just, we're just, you know, M mind you, Mike Q was here on time, on his call time, so you know, <laughs> we're on oh, time. Always on time, yes. Always on time. Because I always say we've been late for the, the late in the world, we got to be on time now, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> um, I guess we could start off really quick, for some people that don't know, uh, could you give us a rundown on like the history of ballroom music, like the music that is played at a ball, uh, I, like even before, like, the performance categories existed. I know like performance wasn't like the, the first category, but there was music always at a ball. So if you could give us a little background on that. Um, so, well, I came first came into ballroom in about 2003. So this is, you know, way after it started. Um, and when I came in, there was already, you know, a whole new form of modern music. But prior to that, uh, ballroom just adapted a lot of house music songs or, even after that, like bitch tracks. So that's what they would use at the balls. It was like never ballroom music. Ballroom didn't have its own music at its time. Uh, so tracks, uh, you would hear like Basement Jacks, Fly Life, Armin Van Helden, Witch Doctor, Joint Venture Master Blaster, Love is the Message, which is the most legendary song ever. Um, the Good Men, that's the, uh, with the name Give It Up, which is the hand performance beat with the drums that you know you'll know. Uh, work this pussy, Rod Junior Vasquez and Sweet Pussy Pauline, C U N T, uh, Robbie Tronco, Robbie Rivera. So a lot of stuff like that, and of course the Ha Dance by Masters at Work, uh, which is probably the most famous, popular track used in ballroom, but it's not a ballroom song. Uh, so that's kind of where all that started. And um, I would say probably in about once the 2000s rolled over and we get to the Von Allure story, that's when we started getting our own music and category specific music and things like that. 
I love that. I think I'll be interested to dig a little deeper in this question. And I have a theory, and I think I feel I've heard this from other people in Barham, but like the BPM of like the house beat that we know that is part of also ballroom music, where did that come along? Like I know, like my, what I know is that I know house music in general, just house culture is so, is a lot more inclusive than, than traditional like club cultures. And I feel like the queer mm -hmm. community, I was attracted to it because of that. Uh, no, there wasn't that fear, you know, of being like, you know, cut up or like, I don't know. So like, I wonder, did, how big does house music play a role in the music we know today? I mean, super huge. Ballroom, ballroom, the ballroom music genre is a subgenre of house, um, period. And there's, there's a lot of subgenres of house, even here in Jersey. I uh, grew up listening to a lot of, well, Baltimore Club, and then later on, Jersey Club. Those are also uh, sub subgenres of house music. So it's a direct, you know, coming from that and is it the and do you know like what's the exact bpm because i know there's like there's like a sweet spot you know for like you know, right like so uh house music a lot of house music in general let's say it'd be like 122 to 128 bpm um that's all the previous stuff but now ballroom the the modern ballroom music i would put between 128 and 132 with 130 being the sweet spot. I love that. I feel like I'm such kind of, I'm, I'm not a music person, but I'm so, I'm so geeky about um, that kind of stuff. So I feel like, I don't know, it, it's cool to hear the differences and how like time changes uh, like our frequency, you know, or and I'm sure maybe it might even, it might go down, especially now that there's so much more soft and kind girls walking. Like, I feel like that's slowing down. Do you feel that as well, like as a trend? Um, I won't say it's like a trend in slowing down beats, you know, beats are made in all types of BPMs. It's just, you know, what's played and what's heard and what's used. Um, I would definitely say that the BPM has gotten faster as well as the Vogue, the style of Vogue has changed, you know, from old way and new way to now Vogue Femme and then dramatics and all that stuff. So it's, it's faster beats and the, the performance of Voguing as well as the music is both going up a little bit. Well, to where it is now, I won't say it's going fast. I don't think it's gonna get any faster in the future. I don't see any hybrid like fast Vogue where on the other hand, Jersey club music is around about 130, 132 BPM as well. Um, and that's like, you know, a lot of hard club music, shake your ass type of stuff. But now a lot of newer producers in Jersey are creating stuff at BPM of like 140. Um, and, you know, the dances with that are getting faster and different. But as far as ballroom, I don't think, you know, I think we're at a point where we're going to stay at as far as the speed of things. Mm -hmm. This is a great segue into, I guess, hearing ballroom music into more mainstream society, like mainstream music now, like what are your opinions? I know you got opinions. <laughs> so let's talk about, <laughs> let's make this opportunity to talk about them and like have a dialogue about it. Um, but yeah, like how do you see ballroom music being used uh, and pushed into the mainstream? Uh, and how do you feel about the appropriation of ballroom in mainstream at the same time? Um, so with the music, I feel uh, it's the culture first itself and, and the voguing that you see, which is what gets out faster or, or that's more present than the music uh, itself. So as that gets more popular, then the music will as well. Um, as far as, as it going mainstream, um, and I'm guessing, you know, this has to deal with, you know, other artists using it and stuff. There hasn't been too much of that. Um, I mean, I'm, I myself have done like like the Missy Elliott thing uh, that was, you know, just a gift from her, just something that she wanted to do. Uh, and I've had been contacted by other people who do music outside of ballroom, but they want that sound. So that's kind of where we're at now. It's not, you know, super out there, or super known of. Um, it's more of the, the culture itself and in the voguing that you see and, and run away and stuff. I guess voguing is the most famous category. So when people think of ballroom, that's what they think of first. 
I'm interested too. I mean, I know runway beats are also like a big part. At least for me, like when I think of music in ballroom, I think of like three things. I have like Vogue, like like performance. I have run. We have runway, and then we have all the other categories that are usually just like old like disco or like funk tracks or like that kind of are for the other categories. Do you find like, do you make your own beats for like other categories as well? Because I feel I've heard your runway beats. I've heard your your like your performance beats. But do you make a beat for like bizarre? Like, do you like do you make a beat for like sex iron? I guess you have some sex iron beats, but um, um, sex so sex iron no. Uh, if I'm doing a ball for sex iron and for realness, I will play a, a hip hop track uh, or acapella. So sex iron, you know, the more sexy slow songs or something that could get you going and dancing. Those are good for sex iron, hip hop stuff. Uh, for realness. As far as creating, I've done old way beats, Vogue, Vogue Femme beats, runway beats, face beats. Uh, what are the categories? I think that's kind of it. Um, that's like the main stuff. And then everything else. Um, also hand performance. That's that's another specific uh, category to make a track for. So off the top of my head, yeah, those are it. Yeah, I'm actually interested on a tangent, how do you prep for a ball? So let's say, I don't know, like, I guess like a mainstream ball, like a big ball, like how would you, what is your thought process in like setting up your, um, yourself? Well, for me, uh, it would be to have the perfect, perfect beat. Uh, of course now, you know, there are a lot of DJs in ballroom and, you know, everyone brings what they bring so of course you know you want to be unique in what you do so it's just planning out music looking over the categories seeing what they're calling for um and just having the right stuff for that and for the most part you know i already have my beats in the folder section by category so there's a lot of just freestyle that goes into it too you know it's not too much preparation and thinking that you have to do or myself so it comes, it comes natural. Yeah, I guess, and on, on that tangent too, I know like the relationship to like, even like break dance or hip hop with having an MC and a DJ and like the person like performing, like how, how, how vital that is. How vital is it for you to have a really good commentator or a host? I'm sure it's instrumental because y'all work together, right? When you're at a ball. How, what's that preparation with, with, the, with those people? I mean, you know, mostly everyone you work with, obviously, but say if it's a new person, like how would you set them up or yeah, like what's the dialogue before? Is there dialogue before? Um, not too much really. So, you know, that whole thing, I call that the Vogue Trinity where you have the MC, the DJ, and you have the person that's on the floor and those three parts is, is your ball. Uh, of course, you have the crowd as well and all the noise they make. But those are your main three parts of the ball. And of course, they have to work together. But uh, as far as like preparation for that, so like a lot of balls and stuff that we get booked for, it's what the promoter of the ball, what they want. So sometimes you may be put with somebody you don't know or people that you do know. It's not really a conversation that we have before. Again, a lot of ballroom is just it's freestyle. So flyer comes out. This is your DJ. This is your MC. It's like, okay. And, you know, you'll go for it. I've had times where there's been mayhem because sometimes you'll have two commentators, uh, a lot of the younger ones. And, you know, they're over each other, not in sync and commentating two different things at the same time. So that gets kind of chaotic on the mic uh but you know we still make it through totally and maybe this is another geeky question but gear wise do you have like a specific gear you like i know sound people y'all so like into your like gadgets and shit like do you have like a perfect setup or like a blue sky or even one that you'd like to have already what do you mean like uh like equipment or equipment yeah yeah <laughs> Uh, equipment. So um, Pioneer equipment is is the mother of them all. <laughs> Let me see. When I when I started balls, you know, I was playing on like the worst, the worst old equipment. Uh, but we still, you know, made it through. Now with the new technology and stuff, I had moved to computers at one time. 
uh, that was kind of fun for what it was. But I enjoy the feel of a, a Pioneer CDJ just with a USB because, you know, that's all I leave with now. It's just a USB and headphones and that's all you need. And then equipment is usually provided at the venue. And that's, you know, that's all I need. Quick and simple, but I've DJed, I've DJed balls with one CD player. Um, I've DJ. they were doing Walk Me Wednesday's ball uh, a few years ago at um, the old live, Laugh Factory in Times Square. And when I got there, there's one CD player for one side and there's a DVD player on the other side. And I had to figure out, you know, how to make that work. So I can be put into any situation and have it happen. I've even DJed the ball from an iPad. So, you know, I'm flexible in that way, but I prefer the whole CDJ turntable situation. Yeah, you make it work. <laughs> we have <Yeah>. to. <laughs> um, I'm interested to hear, actually, I mean, I mean, maybe this is a great opportunity now to talk about people from the past that have inspired you. I, I know uh, we recently lost Juan Allure from like the ballroom scene. Could you talk about your history with them and yeah, how, what, what, what was that? Who, who were they for you? Like, you know, who was Juan Allure to you? Um, so wait, before we get into Vaughn, just a little history on DJs in ballroom. From what I know, uh, a lot of the early DJs and maybe this is around the 70s, 80s, but that was like um, DJ Ralph Milan, DJ Paulie Paul in Philadelphia. He kind of put ballroom on the map down there, um, as well as DJ Robbie Rob, who passed a few years ago. We have DJ Cedric, who put ballroom on the map via the clubs in like the DC area. There's DJ Sean Mugler in Atlanta. Um, but one of the most iconic ballroom DJs for me, besides Vaughn, is DJ Carlton. And DJ Carlton is a heterosexual uh, male DJ who's from the same city as me, East Orange. And he's been DJing balls for 20 plus years now. Um, and he kind of came into the play. Um, someone from ballroom, Derek Prada Ebony, uh, found him in a club here in, in Newark, New Jersey. And heard the music that he was playing and asked them to play a ball. Carlton had never played a ball before. So from there, uh, Derek went into Carlton's music and found a few of the, you know, I don't know what specific tracks, but found a few of the tracks we listen to today and told him to play these at the ball. So he's been doing the balls up until like mm, the late, mid 2000s. Um, and, uh, I met him about 2004 or five with Von Allure. We had went to a uh, latex ball, which is the big free yearly ball that GMHC puts on and call in Angel X, myself, uh, Von Allure. We all went and met DJ Carlton at this ball. And that's how Von got into DJing the latex balls, but musically, um, Vaughn, who is an amazing talent, like it was such a loss to have lost him in ballroom. Yeah, we have his music and we have other DJs to continue on, but he was just such an integral part of the culture. Um, and the role he plays is, I believe in, it was the early 2000s, he got booked to do a ball, I believe in Detroit, and um, he was, I believe, already producing music or whatever, but he got to the ball and everybody just wanted to hear the high dance. So, you know, he wasn't producing music. I'm sorry. Everybody at the ball only wanted to hear the high dance, although he had all this other music. Um, so he's, that's where we got the modern sound from because he started the trend of making remixes of the high, which is the track everyone wanted to hear and making the category specific beats. So I came in, what, 2003, Vaughn might've started this in the year 2000. So, you know, myself, uh, Angel X, JR Neutron, all of us, what we do is, you know, a direct thing from what Vaughn Lord started. Um, and he was just an amazing person, a great friend, always funny, 
like we had so many just like insider jokes where we just laugh and just funny things and just how he was with people like just such a community member bond had a relationship with just about everybody in ballroom and we just always offer tips and you know things and just all of the knowledge that he has because he was not only a ballroom dj and producer but he did walk balls himself uh he walked the old way category um so yeah that's that's monolore for us I'm interested. I mean, thank you for sharing that history with Juan. I feel like I know when that history, like that, that information, that stuff hit, it was, it was, it was, yeah, it was hard for a lot of people in the ballroom scene, especially you yourself being so close to them. Um, how do you, so could you extending into that, could you talk about uh, Queen Beats? What is Queen Beats to you? How, uh, what is that history now? I feel like as an example of like a collective like that, like, yeah, like, I feel like they're like the work that Queen Beats was doing was trying to live on, right? Like do do that, do more of that work supporting each other. What's the history with you and Queen Beats now? Um, so Queen Beat, I started that in 2005. Uh, it was another name was called Greenlight Productions. I had just wanted to make a name to put my music out there. That's, you know, everyone had a, a label or something. It wasn't a label back then. It was just an idea. Um, but then I changed it to Queen Beat, thinking more about the name and and you know what it means and stuff. And it's self-explanatory beats for the queens. Um, so with that, um, you know, I'm doing my music and DJing thing back then, but then just started to get more creative. So seeing that there's other talent in ballroom, whether it's other DJs, producers, or MCs, uh, I first link with uh, Greg Evisu back then, Londa now, um, and we 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 made magic. We started just recording uh, in the attic of my house, and sometimes in one side of a head. Actually, his whole first CD we did record it in like one side of a headphone. Uh, but the music we made was just it was so popular. CDs was a thing back then, so like selling CDs was how I made you know. A, a nice pretty chunk of change um and we were you know able to do this three times back then just with the putting out the cds and stuff and kind of got big with it and then jr neutron came in as a third person and that's when i started to be like okay this is kind of like a family thing and good all cross work and whatnot and then from then on just started adding other ballroom musical talent one by one until we have this family, this collective, where we could, you know, be a label and and something like okay, so ballroom is built, you know, off the whole system of an idea of being in houses. So that's what you could kind of get from Queen Bee. We're not an official house, but you could think of it in that way. Same idea, um, and it's just a place, you know. I've been able and blessed to be able to travel and put my music out and have myself heard. So I want to be able to extend that on to other people any way I can. So that's a platform for them to shine and be heard. I love that. I feel like what I, what I find so beautiful about Ballroom in general, there's, there's this idea of supporting legacy, like continuing on, having a continuation of, you know, of knowledge being pa and that's passed down still really in person you can't really just go out of ball you can't just like like take it out of spotify and like learn like you gotta be there and i think that's the beauty uh, and that's why people are so protective of ballroom and have the gatekeeping is because this is the only way you know we and we want to protect it right so yeah um, and it's like for me it's just it's like one of the last living like cultures yeah. Um, of course, there's been many, but you could just see how a lot of these cultures were tapped into, got mainstream, got popular, everybody got on it, started to want to do it, and then it starts to get, you know, kind of drowned out, and then some people forget about it, like even just in genres of music, a lot of stuff that I've heard over the few years would be a real big genre of music, a lot of DJs start producing it, and you don't hear about it anymore. It was just a trend. And I think this is so different from that 
that, you know, it just should be really cared for in, in such a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think about like, like street dance culture, like, like, and how uh, like break dancing or popping or even like sounds like whacking. I mean, a lot of those musics, like the history of those musics come from a very specific time and the music that you use there. So this is a little different than ballroom, whereas like, in ballroom, like you're really making your own beats. Like if the beats are for the ball, you know, it's for the categories. And I think it's what makes it so special and so unique. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask for an aspiring ballroom DJ, what are things, or especially because you are someone that has helped support a lot of people's careers, how, how would you support, or what, what are the first things you would tell someone? I mean, I think there's some very obvious things you would do, <laughs> but I think someone that is just so green, so new, um, how they get in? Like, what's what's the way in for them? Well, um, so I feel like in these days, even with myself and just everybody, I know a lot of ballroom DJs also produce music. So I feel like that's kind of what got me in there is producing music. I was DJ Mike Q before I was a DJ. I did, I produced ballroom music a whole year before I even knew that I wanted to be a DJ. That just kind of like, came along with it and that's how I got hurt. And so, yeah, um, that, that helps to be a producer as well. Um, I think that's where, cause there's not many DJs that do ballroom and don't produce music, especially now. So that, yeah, that's how you would get your start is to create ballroom before you can DJ it. Yeah. And did you have, did you have, do you have a history like going to school with like music engineering? Like, did you go to like a formalized training or was it all self-taught? All self-taught. Um, I mean, I took, I had audio class in high school, but nothing I learned there came over into this. Even when I was taking that class, I wasn't interested in music. Um, my interest in, in the music came from hearing the music. So that, October day in 2003 at the Globe and first hearing Von Allure's music and seeing Voguing as well is what woke that creativity up in me and inspired me to do the music and then further DJ. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I don't think if I didn't come into ballroom that I would exist right now as a DJ at all. I probably, I mean, I wanted to fix computers. That's what I want to do. <laughs> You would be at Best Buy, you would be at the, we would be. <laughs> exactly. Best Buy was like my go-to. I had applied so many times to like work at Best Buy, but never get in. So yeah. I was actually like a pizza, a pizza guy before I got into, that That was my transition, working at Domino's Pizza and going to the clubs while being in high school. And then the club took over. I love that. Just spinning a different kind of dish. You got pizzas, but now it's been like. Right, you're right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would love to hear. Yeah, now that you talk about your your pizza life, what was like? Who was Mike Q before Mike Q? And what does Mike Q also? Sorry, I'm saying in third person because I feel like that's how it should be. Um, how, like what what do you do outside of the ball? So, like outside of the ballroom, you know? Like what is the life outside of that? Well, I mean, before I was Mike Q, I was this. I, don't know, I guess a nobody. I was always a quiet person in school, not not that loud, and and I'll, even still now, I'm I'm I have this ironic other persona, but I'm still that same quiet to myself person. So most days, if I'm not DJing, I'm in the house doing emails, producing music, chilling with my four dogs, and just living a normal regular life because I like to separate the two. It's a time to be this and the time to be that. But, you know, sometimes it's intertwined. So five minutes out of this moment, I'm doing music and emails. Ten minutes later, I could be just chilling on the couch, you know, watching TV. Um, I like cars a lot. So I do a lot of car meets and whatnot and, you know, stuff like that. And just regular, normal, chill stuff. <laughs> regular, normal, chill stuff. Just traveling all over the country and the world. <laughs> um you have uh, there's a new interest of like photography on your social where is that uh what is that for you are you uh how's that an extension or is it an extension of 
your uh, your artistry as a DJ? Um, it is so as it exists now. It's a a getaway and a separation from that. But I feel like that was woken up by being a DJ and traveling and stuff. And you know, when I started traveling in like 2011, but starting to go to all these amazing places like Tokyo, uh, that was the first place I went to. And just having a camera phone, I'm like, no, I don't know when I'll be back to these places again. So let me get a real camera and take some real pictures. And that that's what woke photography up in me. So I'm now wanting to see all these tourist destinations and landmarks and stuff and, you know, kind of getting good at that. So that became an escape. Now it's like, okay, when I don't want to DJ or not when I don't want to DJ because I DJ every chance that I get. Uh, but when I'm not being a DJ, I want to, you know, travel to the desert or something. I do that a lot every every year. I go to do Milky Way shoots in Utah, Arizona. So completely by myself in the middle of the dark with the camera, taking pictures of the sky, and I enjoy that so much. I'm I'm uh, an introvert, I guess you could say. So I do well with a lot of my own time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I find like most artists in general that we really love, if, I, I mean, thinking about Laomi or even Deshaun, like the people that I know too that are in Baltimore, I'm like, all of y'all are so big on social, but I know you all in person. And like, there is like, you you reserve your energy. I really like, I feel like I really echo that because I feel like out here in the West Coast, like there's not much going on. So we got to keep putting out, but like the stuff that is personal that is for us, we keep it for our people. You know what I mean? Like that personal stuff. And that that's where the introvertedness comes in. Um, yeah. That makes, that balance is so important, I think, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I was gonna, we have a, a question in the thing, um, in the chat. What is your favorite thing about DJing? Um, mixing, mixing. I like, I enjoy mixing two tracks together uh just the way that sounds and and to feel the music and then also the response from people because i can i can dj gigs and it's like five people there i don't feel any energy so it becomes boring for me at that time because it's the people that make the party for me the more they dance and react to the music the better i can play and think of you know different things to do to make them react in a certain way so I think that's that's the enjoyment right there for me. Mm -hmm. And then another question from the same person. Have you ever played rock songs at a ball? Like pop music, pop rock songs from today, like contemporary <laughs> rock? Um, if rock, no. Um, <laughs> maybe someone would have had it on their like production that called for, you know, that type of music. But no, not specifically that. Maybe pop music. Again, during a realness category, if there's a beautiful film queen on the floor, then, you know, maybe some Britney, Beyonce, something like that. That'd be fab. I love that. <laughs> Bring the mainstream into the, into the ballroom. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I'm interested in, it, it, are, you, are you kind of a, a history geek about music as well? Like, do you, because I feel like house music, the lineage of house music, and I think of like, then I think of like, like disco. Then I think of jazz. Then I think of like soul. Like there's all like the, the lineage of like African American music that has influenced the music we know today. Are are you really like, do you, like is that does that inform you as a DJ? Like how you think about music, like mixing, bringing two tracks together. Are you thinking about that, or is it just part of who you are? Which maybe most like um, it's, it's more part of who I am. Um, because when I play, so if, I, if I'm playing, it's like I do hip hop, R&B, ballroom, Jersey club and house music. Um, I don't too much go, unless it's house music, I don't go to different decades a lot. Um, but like, as far as creating, um, I do know, like I was just brought up on just a lot of like soul and funk music and disco and stuff like that. So. A lot of that is incorporated, you know, into a lot of the ballroom music, just, you know, whatever track I decide I want to sample. And I'm starting to like to sample a lot of the stuff from the 70s and 80s now, uh, like the Chaka Khan Ain't Nobody remix and 
uh, the Billy Ocean uh, Caribbean Queen remix and what's the other one I did? George Benson, Give Me the Night. So uh, there's a lot of references just from my childhood and, and growing up that I can apply to, to now. I love that. I feel like, I don't know, I always think, when I think of this idea of referencing of music, jazz does this a lot. There's always this like call out kind of like, remember the past, remember the history, but bringing it now. Like Missy does it a lot. Like I know Timbaland does it too. Like all these amazing producers do it. And like, I think of Badu, Erica Badu too. Like every song has like 10 samples or 10 like references. And it's so exciting. It's like these little Easter eggs. If you know your music, um, it's really exciting. Do you find, uh, I guess, do you find that same excitement now as you're exploring this like new way of sampling? Definitely. That's sampling is always, I think the most exciting thing uh, for me with the modern sound of ballroom that Bonalua created, it came with a lot of sampling, uh, a lot of those original house songs that ballroom used at balls and stuff. So, uh, you know, my whole life is built on sampling. And then, you know, speaking of a lot of hip hop music, which samples so much stuff from 10 and 20 years back, I find myself, you know, hearing these songs. And then years later, I'll come across the original song that I didn't even know was a sample. And then I'm starting to listen to that song now. So a lot of my uh, playlist is built off of a lot of 90s hip hop mostly, and then the songs that they sample. So yeah, I love that. I love it so much. Yeah, I think there's a track that something happened to me when I was in, I was in a Uber in the Philippines a few years back. And this is like when uh, Badu did that cellophone, like a uh, album that came out. And there's a little like a uh, squirrel friend, something squirrel, something squirrel. Um, I forgot what the track was, but I remember I heard, I think it was like a 70s version, like the original version she sampled in, in like a car in an Uber in the Philippines, or like just on the radio. And I was like, wait a minute, I got to know. So I went to my sampling and it was exactly the same song she referenced. And there's actually different variations of it. I'll try to find it and send it to you later, but I just love wow. it. We're like, wait a minute, I know that song. <laughs> See, I didn't even know that she had, besides, you know, the Drake sample, I didn't even know more of that was sample and that uh was so funny you brought that up because that uh ep was produced by a friend of mine zach witness who's a kid he's from texas i think he's in london now um and you know was already connected to him before i even knew that he produced that so that was so cool and he actually just remixed uh, the theme song of legendary with me so oh, that's going to be coming out soon okay and it's it's the craziest thing, yeah. Will, that, will they be using that version for season three? <laughs> um, no, this is this. Uh, I'm doing a remix EP or album uh, of the title track, but this is you know separate from the show and what they're doing. Maybe they'll want to use it. We'll see. <laughs> uh, going into this direction of music and like that is like sampling. Do you have like do you have like a top three favorite songs? I know this might be a little hard. I think it's hard to ever like distill your favorite or at least your favorite songs right now. Like when you go when you listen to it, you're like, it's like your go-to. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sheesh. So it's weird. I listen, like I said, I listen to a lot of 90s hip hop. So off the top of my head, I mean I just listened to Mob Deep's whole first and second album, Erica Badu's entire first album. Uh, Jill Scott, I listen to a lot of smooth jazz, also a lot of like Paul Hardcastle and Alex Bunyan and stuff. Um, back when we had CD 101.9, which is a jazz station they used to have uh, on the FM stations here, which went away. Um, so it's, it's really nothing specific. It's so many songs that I love right now. I could not name just three, but those are my main go-tos. Yeah, I feel Mom like- D Jill Scott, Erica Badu, um, Bone Thugs and Harmony. I listen to, like, I don't listen to beats for fun. It's hip hop, like, you know, tradey shit. <laughs> <laughs> Trade and shit. We love to see it. <laughs> Talking about radios, would you ever want your own radio station or do a radio show? <laughs> um, And that's so my earliest, earliest earliest thing with music is um 
back when I used to, you know, have a stereo. I don't remember what age I was, but I always, you know, would have the thing with the microphone. So I would create my own radio stations uh, and have it, I'll record it on a cassette tape. So I'd be the radio interviewer. I'd be the celebrity guest, just, you know, switch my voice up, talking to myself on tape then play some music, play some commercials. It was like so set up on cassette tape. Um, I wish I had a copy to listen to now. But oh, yeah, that that was like yeah. before I even thought about producing or being a DJ, that's what I used to do when I was younger. So yeah. I would definitely, I would definitely do that That'd be in the so future. To have like a ball, like, like a night, like a radio station, like on a Friday night or like on, you know, I love when you have your lives. I feel like I remember during COVID early times, you were doing a lot of lives for a bit. And that was so great just to even like, even see it or listen to it later or after, or even also most recently, your Boiler Room uh, collaboration. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about that? That was so exciting. Um, yeah, I mean, well, so back to the, the lives, you know, that's how I got through the pandemic for the most part. That was my outlet just to be able to plug in and, and still play music for people um and a lot of those mixes which i still have all of them are some of the favorite mixes i've created because a lot of them are two three and four hours long which is wild because mixes will only be one hour before that um so that was amazing and then boiler room that being able to do that again which was like my fifth or sixth one um uh so you know them finally being able to do uh ballroom boiler room i had always had that idea uh, unfortunately I, I wish that fun allure could have been there because i wanted him to be a part of that back when i had the idea a few years ago um i did want it to be more at a ball or a ball setting with you know maybe some categories and voguing and be able to display that but what we were able to do was really great and i'm, I'm glad the way it came out it was so great. It was like, there was the production. Like, y'all really put it together. <laughs> yeah. It was bad. Um, yeah, I, I feel like we should start wrapping up. I, I feel like we just hanged out for the whole, like, 50 minutes. This is so bad. I'm so happy we get a chance to actually, like, talk like this in the public as well, even though we're quite introverted people at the same time. <laughs> yeah, right. But... Yeah, do you do you have any last words to say to the people that are seeing this later or um thank you for tuning in for one if you if you're still watching now or you watch later and you get to this part thank you for listening to me talk which is something I do not do a lot um <laughs> you know even when you ask me I'm like oh my god another talk thing and I always get you know so shy and stuff for these things but I always still do them I like to you know be able to give my my voice to the world in whatever way I can. So thank you. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, I was happy you still follow through because I know these things can be really intimidating. And I, I'm happy we took that kind of this version of like an interview talk, like we're in Wendy Williams or something, you know, but yeah. how are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is a great way. And I think it, it really gives the opportunity to hear who's behind the, yeah, who's behind the mix or who's behind the, the beat, you know, I feel it's such a nebulous world, like, in ballroom, and I feel like, unless you're there, you can't really get to know people and, and learn about, like, the culture, and I feel like that's what, that's the hope for these talks that we have right now, uh, these next weeks coming up to the ball. Um, before I go, I'm gonna just uh, put this poster as, like, a pin right now, so you can see what's happening, spotlight for everyone. We have a ball coming up July 31st. <laughs> we have a ball coming up July 31st. Hi. Uh, we're going to have all these categories. We have a few more talks still left uh, uh, with uh, Cuerta, who's uh, kind of hosting a talk about the Latine community. Um, we also have a talk uh, and a show and tell with uh, Felix Milan from Old School Ballroom, who will show old videos from the 90s, from the balls in the 90s, which I'm really excited about. Y'all can't find right. that on Instagram, on YouTube. So, like, uh, it's going to be a really special moment there. Uh, thank you so much, Mike Q, for joining me today on a Saturday. Um, and I can't wait to see you again, hopefully in person. Oh, soon. It's going to yes, happen. Yes, for sure. For sure. <laughs>